Yeah, no, listen, thanks very much, um, uh, Brian, for inviting me along to, to talk today. And I suppose as many of you, um, I've met many of you over the years, and today, I, I suppose, this is definitely a non-commercial type presentation, obviously, but I really want to try and share as much of what we're seeing working when it comes to personalization um, across higher education organizations around the world. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, a, a few words. I suppose I've been involved in higher education, sort of web content management for many years. We, we work at about uh, just under 190 universities around the world, and definitely the hot topic, and one of the areas where you can get the best bang for your book and effort is around personalization at the moment. And I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to give you some practical things you should definitely look at. It does, I know many of you are on our own system. Some of you aren't. Don't worry, if there's, there are actually are ways of doing this, uh, even if you don't, you don't need to whole, retrofit everything you have, your whole platform, there are ways of plugging in some of the things that I'm talking about, and I can talk to you about this afterwards to give you some guidance on that. But feel free as well, we're always happy to sort of share experiences of uh, things that work well for other universities and colleges. So really what I'm going to talk about today is really looking at how some of the e-commerce techniques can work in a higher ed environment. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges in that people get very excited about you know, the way online e-commerce experiences can be um, personalized. And then they go, okay, well, how do I use that in higher education? One of the biggest challenges is, though, that all the techniques that are used in online retail and e-commerce don't really, not all of them work well in higher ed. It's a different type of sale. There's no, unless you're doing like short courses, there isn't necessarily a shopping cart where you go, oh, I'll take that degree and that degree and I'll have, you know, I'll have it wrapped, please, and one day delivery. You know, obviously it does, that doesn't apply. But there are certain techniques that work, work well. <coughs> The, the second thing is, what problems does it solve? And I think this is one of the biggest ones that I think provides the biggest benefits in higher education. And I think we all know about the fight over the home page, you know, and so on. I think that's even that, solving that problem alone can just have a much better experience for potential students or other target audiences visiting the website. And I'm going to talk about that um, and, and walk through an example. I'm also going to talk about a little bit of prerequisites. So whether this is on your, you're on our system or not on our system, there are certain, I would say, web governance, um, things you need to have in place before you start playing around with things like personalization, A-B testing, and other sort of very modern techniques. And I think it's just for your own sake. You can end up actually opening a bit of a can of worms if you don't have the right things in place. Um, you know, things like good content quality. You know, there's no point personalizing crappy quality crappy quality content and so on. Um, and then really I'm, going to, I'm actually going to show you some quick examples of things, very simple examples, but to get you into the, get your brains uh, moving at this early hour to at least start thinking about some of these cool things. So one of the, obviously all of this has sort of come from a sort of e-commerce point of view. And I think that you only have to, when you're making the business case for trying this sort of stuff, looking at good examples, airlines are probably a really good example because they, they very strongly use e-commerce personalization. Uh, and actually, Aer Lingus is, before we moved completely to higher ed, uh, Aer Lingus' website is actually still running our software. Um, but it's one of the really nice ones that I like because you can actually, using the option up at the top, um, at the very top right, you can actually manipulate the, you can actually set the personalization rules yourself. This also raises some of the questions. The reasons why they did this was because that they found that they were targeting a lot of American companies in Ireland, but one of the problems was the GOIP personalization was saying that they were in America and not in Ireland. So they sort of allowed it to be overridden. But it's a really good way of sort of you're looking at how sort of airlines and others use this can really get people excited. But then it's trying to apply this to higher ed, I think, is the, is the big challenge. So really, there's a, quite a number of personalization techniques. I'm going to talk about later on then which of these work we, from our experience, which ones of these we found work well and which ones of these I think are difficult to implement in higher ed or will give you false, um, uh, sort of, uh, will sometimes guide potential students along the wrong path. So things like, for example, geographic personalization. I think you're also familiar with that. You basically, there's an, an IP lookup and you can place where people are. The key thing there is, look, you don't want to be so specific and try and guess exactly where they are. Um, like you know, even to country level or I would even say like even in the UK 
it's it's hard to get it anywhere beyond sort of you know country level. Uh, it typically goes back to the uh, your ISPs data center where they're located. And there's some really good stories if you're interested in some entertaining reading about how people keep turning up at this farm in Kansas um, where there's this 80-year-old uh, and all these people, people left like a, a toilet in his driveway and he had no idea and the, the FBI and everything keep raiding his place. And what the reason was, was MaxMind, one of the companies who do these GYP databases, when they're not sure where an IP address was, they put it into the center of the US into the like the geographic center it just happened to be this guy's farm so he kept having people turn up like angry husbands worried about their wives run you know and, and they kept turning up at this 80 year old man's door so just don't use it too specifically but you can use it in really smart ways and um, behavioral personalization is where you look at the click trail of what works this works a lot in e-commerce um, it looks at, uh, you know, say for example, you, and it's a, it's a bit obvious in Amazon, you know, where you like, you almost see your own click trail at the bottom of the, um, of what you're, you're looking at. It sort of says, you might be up so interested in these three other things you just looked at. So I think in higher ed, I'll talk about some of the challenges around that later on. Uh, purchase history, um, you know, in higher ed, this could be, well, I know that this person has completed a degree in aeronautical engineering. And I know that because they clicked through an alumni email. And then I'm going to say, well, actually, would you be interested in a master's? You know, why use all your real estate trying to push under another undergraduate degree when you can upsell um, to maybe something that a short course or a master's or something like that? Um, email marketing, I think, is the most underused. This is where you can seed data. Um, I'm going to show an example of this um, today from an alumni perspective where you can seed data in because you know who the person is and they can only have clicked on a link if they've got it by email so you do a special URL and then that tells the website who you are and you could even have lots of data in there like what they studied when they left you know hey it's much better now we've, we've redone all the, um, the accommodation it's, it's, uh, it's not infested anymore and all the rest um, another good one is people visiting from other organizations. This is really useful. So you can tell by looking at the, there's a variable that comes back on these databases of IP addresses, gives you the name of the, the organization. Now sometimes that's an, I, uh, an ISP, so Virgin Media or something like that. But if it's from a university, it's, it's always gonna be like university of or whatever. So using some very simple regular expressions, because one of the things you'll find is that almost all the universities in the world, in most languages, if you do a search for anything that contains UNIV, it's most likely a university. Now, there's some other rules you need to put in, like school and college and so on. But you can also then use that to target other universities, maybe in your area or locally. So it means then you know that if someone's on their network visiting your website, then there's a very good chance that they're not, pro maybe they're interested in transferring, maybe they're interested in postgraduate, you maybe they're interested in jobs and so on. But you can sort of use that to say, well, hang on, they're already in a university. So therefore, how I'm going to talk to them is going to be very different to somebody doing their A-levels um, or before. And you can use that as a way of targeting the content. Um, retargeting. Uh, how many people here have, are using retargeting in their university? OK, it's probably about half here. OK. This is something, so for those of you who don't or haven't used it, play around with it. Like you can do it without sort of uh, blowing all your budget in, 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 a, in a day. Um, it's basically, you know this sort of thing where the ads follow you, you know, where you go onto a website and then suddenly every banner ad you see is for like, you know, the brand new Dyson, you know, vacuum cleaner. And you're like, go away, you know, I was just checking. Now it's suddenly following me. But you can be a lot smarter about it. And, and particularly there's solutions like ad roll, um, uh, if you haven't checked it out, it's pretty easy to set up. Um, what you can do is you can actually upload things like email addresses of people. So if, in your CRM, you can say, Here's a people who are, here are people who are interested in engineering. And what you can do is you can actually set up segment, segmented lists in, in the tools like AdRoll so that those people will start seeing ads even if they haven't visited your website in, in a certain period of time. But the key thing is with retargeting is to really focus it, not just to go, oh, the University of 
blah. It's, you should really start talking about some good engineering stories if, if you know that they're interested in engineering undergraduate course. And, but basically set up your segments and you can give them like an email, a list of email addresses and say, these people, if, they, if you see them on the web, start targeting them this way. It's a bit freaky actually, but it's, it works quite well. The key thing is with that, you have to measure because unless you're looking at the conversion rates, whether it's working or not, you can, it's a bit like AdWords, you can sort of spend a lot of money pretty quickly without good impact. The one that's quite exciting, and I'm not going to talk too much about today, but definitely worth um, looking into a bit more. It's been used by a lot of, some U, I'm not say a lot, some US universities with actually pretty good success, is using predictive analytics models to try and predict the people who are going to be potentially good people to target for your university. So, so what some people um, are doing is, uh, uh, this, I've, I've heard some good talks at some conferences. The good thing is about this is like the entry level to get into this is pretty easy. Like things like Facebook, for example, you can give them a batch of people or batch of email addresses and say, these are people. We would like to target people like these people. You know, so, so what they do is, um, there's a university in St. Louis in the US, um, and what they do is they do exactly that. He, he's using growth hacking techniques to try and increase the conversion rates on the, the, the university website. So he, they, from the CRM, he's able to tell people's email addresses who have either, I would say, good applicants, you know, good people. They'd say, we want more people like this person. So instead of going into Facebook and going, I want somebody in this age group who likes goldfish and, you know, likes playing chess and you're trying to sort of second guess you know the rules and when you're doing sort of social media advertising you can actually use give them a batch of data they'll crunch through it and then they'll target people like that now it can be sometimes a little bit hit and miss but if you try it and you're just constantly measuring its success it actually can work really well and um, it's something that I would say it's early days but it's something definitely worth playing around with even just like on a small budget to, to see how you get on so I suppose, how can this all be used in, in higher ed? And I suppose really the biggest, biggest challenge is this, this diagram. I think it originated from about 10 years ago in the US. But it's the, I think in practice, if we all think about our, our home pages of the university website, there's often so many different journeys that you're trying to start from that place. You know, whether it's undergraduate, um, student recruitment journeys, whether it's postgraduate, you know, then you have the, let's call it the vice chancellor demands, you know, um, I need my photo bigger and I need my speech louder on the homepage. Luckily, now, these days, it's, that's less the case than it was a number of years ago. But I think often you have the challenge around, you know, you've got people from the research side of the university, the undergraduate and so on. So like looking at this, um, I picked the University of Toronto, mainly because they wouldn't be up by now. So as I'm talking about them, then they won't, uh, although they're probably a social media person is probably there like getting alerts maybe. Uh, but it's, I think it's a good example it's of a good university website. I think it looks well, it looks smart and, uh, and so on. Um, but I think you've got this sort of challenge, like firstly up on the top left, you've got like a pile of links here that are actually pretty prominent talking about sort of internal systems, webmail, portal, I'm not sure what Acorn is. Anyway, you know, internal sort of type stuff. Then you have like your, your big mega image. That looks great. You've got the latest news. And I think yesterday, I think there were, I don't know, it's maybe on Tuesday, it was like news is dead on a university website or the, or the need for it. I would a little bit disagree, but I think the problem is here. So if you look at this news, and I think many of us would see, is that there's very, yeah, there's a lot of the news is sort of like, it's very untargeted. So say for example there, I'm, I'm not really sure what, the, if I'm not interested, say, in research in Toronto, I'm not really interested in teddy bears or sharks. I've really no idea. Anyway, but you know what I mean? Like, it's not actually helping me with anything that I'm interested in. But maybe it should know a little bit more about me. I could adjust the news or maybe what research is shown on the homepage. Um, then, there, for example, there's, there's, a, whole, uh, there's the whole, a whole part of the, about the medical school. Okay. But say, for example, I'm an undergraduate who's interested in, like, in you know, business or I'm interested in something else, having something about dancing in the, the medical school, you know, it, it can actually be a negative sometimes. That if someone keeps coming back to your site and you're, you keep showing the shining stars of the university, but if 
those shining stars aren't the courses or the areas that I'm interested in, it can actually start to annoy you. It's like, why do you keep talking about the business school? I want to do engineering, and engineers are best. You know, that sort of thing. So, but the stuff like this that you can start using to do clever stuff, and then you have your arbitrary sort of like big footer with every other link that everyone else asks you to, uh, to, have, on, to have on the site um, as well. So I think this is sort of, the, the, this is the common sort of issue that I think a lot of, that, that gets solved by a lot of this. And I think it's something that, if you can at least get your homepage right, that's something that's re that can be really strong around this. When you're looking at this, you have to look at your segments, and that's the first thing that you need to. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is really decide on the segments that you want to target. The challenge with doing personalization is that you can sometimes come up with too many segments, and this will link into what I'm talking about—the governance things that you need to have in place. So these are ones I just like. These ones would probably apply to almost every university. Um, the, so for each of these, you'll probably have different call to actions. Um, but when you start applying, so you have this list here of nine segments, and then you have your course areas. So maybe you have like, you could have 16 sort of course topic areas. You have just, for example, if you start multiplying out the number of permutations that you can have, it actually gets very uncontrollable. So that's why you need to have some of the structure in place to manage this, and don't try and buy it off too much from the beginning. Because you'll just, you know, if you can imagine how many variants you could suddenly have, even if you didn't take in course topic areas into this, you've suddenly got eight different potential versions of the home page. Often it's hard enough just to manage one of them with good quality content, so you need to have a good structure in place. Um, so really the key thing is it's all about driving calls to action, right? Whether that's, and I think this is something that I think is quite, I think a lot of universities can do better is having better call to actions, but actually measuring them and using though that data as your flag waving uh, content that you can then go up and talk to senior management and say, well, we made this difference. We spent ten thousand pounds on doing this marketing piece or doing this activity, and it actually increased uh, conversion. So the results can be actually great. Because so few universities are actually doing this, you've actually got a really good opportunity. So like generally, people are saying in the, it outside, even across um, the whole world, like in companies and organizations outside higher ed, just by doing personalization and content targeting, you can get an 18%, I think, is the rough figure about the improvement you can see. We're seeing that as well. In higher education, we're seeing it even better. We've got clients like who are getting, in this case, Swinburne in Melbourne, who got like a 32% increase in conversion um, by doing some just simple, smart stuff. So this is stuff that can actually make you and your web team and your digital marketing team, you know, really show some really good successes. But you have to then use that as a way, as becoming a catalyst for them investing into your team, not reducing the size of your team, not cutting budgets, not cutting corners, but actually going, well, we spent this and we got this return. So this is where I talk about the, um, the prerequisites. And I'll talk about this very quickly. My point is, is that all of this, it creates more demands from a content point of view. So as I said, like even just those eight variants of different segments, you need to get this stuff in place. Firstly, you have to have the website architecture in a reasonable state. You know, do not dive into this if you're still having worries about you know, stability of your website or you, know, the, it's, you don't have the resources to maintain it in a normal way. You have to get your website into good shape. You have to have the content in good shape. You have to have good content authoring processes because you know, you're going to have to write more content. And, or, or develop more content, whether it's images. So you need to have that structure in place. The next thing you need to do before you do this is you need to have collected data on how things are succeeding right now. So looking at things like how many people are going to our calls to action, how many people are not completing a call to action, how many people are completing a form. So in some cases, that can be because and you know, you're, you're doing all your inquiries through email addresses. So you can't track the... Um, how many people are inquiring. So therefore, you can't show how, how much of a difference this sort of stuff is going to make. Then you can start getting into the personalization, and then you can start doing better 
targeting true forms and better measurement true forms. But my point is really that you just don't just dive into this. It's, it's actually really cool to play around with, but it's a little bit like, um, it's like a, a, a kid's sand pit. You know, it's lots of fun, but unless you put down the, you know, the thing on the floor, it's just going to be a, a huge mess. Sorry, as you can tell, I now have kids. So, you know, you just need to, to make sure that you have the prerequisites in place. So one of the things that I'm going to talk about now is just very quickly is I'm going to show you some quick examples. The, um, so we have um, just a sample sort of website that we use for some of this. And I'm going to just quickly show you an example. In higher ed, I would say the biggest, um, if you want to visit a version of this, it's samplesite.terminal4.com. So you can have a look at it. You know, it's nothing fancy, but it, it does cool things like integrates with tribal and stuff like that. But anyway, I'm not sure if that's exciting, but anyway. Um, so here, for example, one of the biggest, biggest, biggest opportunities you have for personalization in higher ed is using your course search facility. If that is like you watching over somebody's shoulder and seeing what they're interested in. They're telling you, for example, I am interested in undergrad, say, science. Okay. Um. <laughs> so using that, so then you know, obviously your course search and everything like that, you go back to, say, the home page. You can then use this to start targeting different things here. For example, now you can start using different banners to say, well, I actually now know this person's interested in science. I now know that they're interested in undergraduate level. So suddenly, it actually frees up a lot of real estate on the, on the website that you wouldn't normally have available. So suddenly on the home page, like if you think of the University of Toronto, where they had the huge part about the medical school, I can now say, well, actually, this is some cool stuff that we're doing in the science department. The other way, of, uh, the other part I would look at is um, when it comes to geographic personalization. That can work really well for international students. And I would say it's, it's not just outside the UK. We have a medical school client, and they have um, target audiences in Malaysia, the Middle East, uh, and the US. But the needs of those potential students are very, very different to, um, to each other. So the needs of someone coming from Malaysia is very different to somebody from the US. And you can use things like that to, to target. The other one is when you have an email, that one of the things you can do is you can, as I said earlier on, you can see the URL. So I'm going to actually sort of force it here to happen, is that I'm going to actually go to the alumni area here. And so say if I got this link in an email, I can actually have this seeded with some data about me, as I said. So now if I have clicked to this link, and this link perhaps is only available from an email marketing campaign that's gone out. Now, obviously, I, you know, I could navigate to here to my demo site for, for demo purposes. But if I then go back to the home page, it can then target things about, say, for example, uh, giving or something like that. So you have alumni giving campaign. We're going to build a new library. Can we have a couple of million, please? Um, so it's starting to use, you have this data, but it's about connecting the dots between the different sources. And it's some simple techniques that you can do to use this that actually really work very well. Um, and we're finding, like, just doing things like, for example, instead of, say, inviting people to, like, a huge open day, saying, well, actually, we're doing an open day for the engineering school and targeting at people who are interested in engineering, you'll get a much better level of conversion. So just to really, so I talked about these earlier on, but I would, earlier on, but I would just say just to, to as I'm coming the, towards the end of the presentations, the ones to be very wary of here are behavioral personalization, looking at the click trail, particularly in universities, because your websites are so big, sometimes people can deep link in somewhere that isn't the home page, and they click around a little bit to sort of get back on track. And if you're listening or using that data to personalize, it can sometimes set you off, set somebody off on the wrong path. The, um, I think that's one that to be very aware of. What I would say is definitely around, I'd say predictive and retargeting is definitely one to play around with. And I think that's something you'd, for a tiny bit of budget, you'd actually be able to see what the results are like. The key point that I want to leave with you today is you, before doing any of this, right now you need to be collecting the right non-vanity metrics. And it's all about really getting to know and love your, say, in the terms of, say, undergraduate student recruitment, really getting to know your student recruitment funnel. And, you know, there's lots of different steps. And some of these are managed by, say, student recruitment people in your, in your university, if, if you guys aren't joined up with them. Um, but there's lots of other things you can measure. For example, visits to the inquiry form, or people com completing the inquiry forms. If you can show improvements in those areas, that is extra revenue and money 
to the university. And I think that is sort of stuff that you, I believe, needs to be better understood and better exposed to web teams and digital marketing teams. Because if you're able to show the improvements you can make to this funnel, you can use that. That is the strongest business case for budget uh, within your universities. And I call that the pre-funnel. So it's sort of like the stuff that before they've inquired. If you can improve that, that's like you're really putting more stuff into the top of the recruitment funnel. And really, a lot of this is really to help drive budget. And we all know like how scarce sometimes resources are, or sometimes big projects. You know, you get the big budget to do your big project, and then sort of that, that's year one, and then suddenly year two, that maybe isn't around. So you need to be able to show your success. So look, I hope today it was just a very quick presentation on, on a topic that I know um, some of you are playing around with and some of you are maybe just thinking about or maybe some of you haven't really, you're, you're not in the place for it right now. But hopefully today it's sort of giving you a good idea of sort of what some of the things we have seen working in other universities. Um, yeah, I'm very happy and to talk about any of this sort of stuff even offline as well. Um, we do have um, our only little plugs here is we have a blog that's, I would recommend, it's, it's completely non-commercial. What we try and do is use it to show examples of people doing really cool things across universities all around the world. It, it's followed by about a thousand people from about a thousand universities. Um, but also, if you've done really cool things, please let us know, because we're always, um, you know, if it is genuinely cool. <laughs> um, we do sort of show it off, and we're, we're, uh, you know, it can be a good way f as a platform to show off some of the good work you're doing. We're also doing, um, every year we do an annual higher education web survey, which looks at trends, but also this year we're looking at things like team structure and resources that are in web teams. Um, and we give away Amazon vouchers as well to, as like prizes for filling it out. Um, there's usually about, we get responses from about like 300 universities and we, we then share the report around with everybody. Um, but look, I hope this is of interest to you. Um, happy to take any questions that you might have. I don't know how we're uh, doing time-wise, Claire. Yeah, we can probably just squeeze in one question, if anyone's got anything for Piero. So this is actually stolen from someone else on Twitter, but um, what's the cookie law implications of altering someone's experience like this? I think mainly from the, from the privacy point of view, I think you just need to be open about in your privacy policy in terms of what you, you know, and, and like obviously the cookie disclaimer and all the rest, right? But you just need, I think with the privacy policy in particular, and actually solutions like AdRoll will actually check your privacy policy. So if you're doing retargeting, for example, they will actually check your privacy policy before they let you turn on their service to be able to, um, to be able to, uh, uh, what would you call it, like uh, to, to use their service. So I would just say is just be very transparent in your privacy <coughs> policy as to what information you're using of theirs. And um, none of this is like, if anything, when you're setting a cookie, the ideal way is you set like an anonymous, um, what would you call it, like string, a, a visitor session or um, a, an ID, and then you use that to look up the data rather than sort of leaving the, 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 pre the preferences such as like engineering, year they graduated and stuff like that actually on their browser. But once, I think once, uh, once you're open in your privacy policy about how you're using the information, uh, and you just don't do stupid things though as well. Like I think you don't want to freak people out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't do stupid but, things, folks. Yeah, I think you definitely don't want to, f like I would say is don't over-personalize. Like you can sort of freak people out if you start saying, ah, this is what I really know about you. Like so in the US, what some people do is, um, I know of one university where they were having um, they were actually having quite big security problems on campus. Um, so people were very concerned about campus security. So what they were doing was, but obviously they didn't want to say that on the homepage, like we're a really safe place to come, because then anyone who didn't know about the security problems they were having, but then were like, what do you mean that we have the best police force in the university? So what they did was they looked at people visiting the content on sort of the, uh, the, the security uh, facilities available and so on. And then they use that to know that someone then is concerned about that, which then they fed into the CRM. So when um, a student advisor rang them up and talked to them about their needs, they would know that that was maybe a concern. So you just, I think maybe you just have to be a bit careful. You have to be careful about not doing freaky things. But if you sort of look at things like geography and basic sort of topics, then, you know, I think it's, I think you're, that's probably the, as far as I think you would need to go for the moment anyway. I hope that makes sense anyway. Brill. If we can show our appreciation the usual way, thank you very much. Thank you.